Kubrinsky. Um, I'm going to talk to mo today about uh, microservices, uh, but uh, not from the happy path, but from the set path, path of the maintainability. And it will be just a naked truth. So uh, I will talk about the consequences of the actions we as developers are taking. So um, just to see if we are really aware of uh, what the microservices are, um, what are the uh, strange things that can happen to us uh, when we decide to go um, uh, with this, this way. And uh, uh, do I know what I'm talking about? So uh, that is the uh, SLA uptime report for our platform uh, for the last uh, 10 weeks. So as you can see, there is no even a single outage, no downtimes. So uh, it's n th this situation uh, didn't look the same at the beginning. So we're learning how to maintain the distributed environment, how to maintain the environment hosted uh, on a public cloud, because it's a totally different set of skills that, that, we, need to, uh, that we need to get. And uh, I, I want to share with us my experience, which led us to this uh, pretty good looking situation. So a uh, few words about me. I'm the co-founder of DevSkiller. DevSkiller is a platform that uh, helps assessing the developer's skills uh, in recruitment, in e-learning, in certifications, and um, uh, the other use cases as well. I'm also doing uh, trainings mostly on the architecture and, and Java at Bottega company. I'm the program committee member of uh, DevOps PL conference, and I'm a co-author of the Spring Cloud contract um, project that I will mention later. Uh, you can mention, uh, follow me on Twitter if you have any, uh, I don't know, notes or questions, just, just tweet me and I, I will try to uh, answer them uh, as well. So one of the Polish prime ministers said that uh, you can tell the real man observing how he ends, not how he starts. And we can paraphrase the sentence um, uh, on the IT area. And I can say that you can tell the real developer observing how he maintains not how he starts. And I think it's crucial because uh, there are many developers that are waiting to create something that makes sense uh, to the first kid, okay? Because uh, everything earlier is, is, is uh, just a prototyping. So we are writing a code, but we are not thinking about how uh, I can maintain this code on, on production, okay? Uh, all logger statements in our applications are not important for our application to run, but they're really important to maintain. Metrics, all this stuff, it's everything that is, that's important on a production-ready systems. Okay, and I want to talk about, uh, about, uh, about this one. So it won't be the talk about the tutorials, it will be a talk about doing and creating distributed systems to be production ready. And at the very beginning, I want to ask you, when you think about the microservices, uh, what is the scale of the microservices that you have in mind? So uh, I know that uh, measuring the, the, the software in the lines of code is uh, it pretty, it, it sucks, okay, to be honest. But uh, it, it's good enough metric for, for, for now. So uh, how many of you please raise your hands think that the microservice is something that has 100 lines of code? Okay, just single hands. 1,000 lines of code. Okay, 10,000 lines of code. Okay, and 100,000. Okay, no hands. So uh, the most of you said that 1K is a valid uh, size of the microservice. And I, I don't want to judge if 1K is okay and it's better than 10K, but let's think from the raw mathematical fundamentals. So. I can assume that just an average enterprise application, a single application in the company, has like half a million lines of code, okay? And it's not the biggest application I've seen. I've been working with applications having like three, four, five million lines of code, okay? So assuming that you want to split this application into microservices, 
While single microservices have 1,000 lines of code, it means that dividing single application in the enterprise produces 500 microservices, okay? Is it a lot? I don't know if it's a lot, but it's a scale of the whole Netflix business, okay? So Netflix has around 500 microservices, and those microservices are maintained by 1,500 uh, engineers, okay? So how many engineers do we need to um, uh, maintain one uh, enterprise application with half million lines of code? 20? 10? Definitely not 1,500, okay? So just looking at this simple uh, uh, calculation, we can say that microservices with the size on 1,000 lines is just a bullshit, okay? Microservices are not small. Of course we can divide this application into smaller ones, but maybe five, maybe eight applications, definitely not 500. Okay, microservices as ju are just small monoliths. Okay, they are doing something important. They are solving some real business problem. Why? Because microservices are business oriented. When you are thinking about uh, describing a boundary for the particular microservice, you must think from the business perspective. Uh, there is uh, some, some technique called uh, domain-driven design, DDD. And uh, in DDD, on the strategic level, we have something called a bounded context, okay? And a bounded context is a great, uh, and I think that uh, probably even the best, uh, natural limit for microservices. What's the bounded context? Often it's just, uh, I don't know, department in the company, okay? So what with the all other stuff? Okay, for technical stuff, we have jars. I don't need to treat my PDF generator or I don't know, Excel importer as a microservice. Okay, it can be, uh, uh, it, it can live in a separate repository, but I can use it as a dependency without any runtime dependencies to, to, to keep this uh, application up and running, okay? so. Remember that when we are talking about the microservices, we are talking about the pro pro products, not about the repositories, okay? I can have much more repositories than microservices because my microservice can use some jars. It can even, I don't know, download the code, include this code, some util classes, okay? Some uh, technical stuff, circuit breakers, uh, I don't know, service discoveries. All this stuff are valid, but it's not said that it must be a separate microservice. And why? It's not because I just said that, hey, microservices must be business oriented, okay? It's because I'm doing microservices and I'm going that way because I want to achieve something real. What do I want to achieve? I want to achieve the autonomy. Why? Because in a big company, we have many different departments, and those departments have different targets. They have different timelines, okay? And they don't want to wait for the other department with the release just because we are sharing the same monolith. They want their features, their functionality, to be delivered now, not in two, two months, two weeks, half a year, okay? They don't want to wait for someone they just don't care about. And with microservices, especially with the microservices uh, following the bounded context boundaries, we can create a situation where single business department is uh, fully autonomous. They don't need to wait for others to release the software, okay? So I want my software to be uh, autonomically uh, deployed, updated, upgraded, okay? Without any breaking changes. I defer my changes to be uh, all the time to be able to communicate with other microservices because microservices is all about talking to each other. 
okay? Because I, I must communicate with other microservices to share my, my, my features, my functionality, etc. Okay? So that's the most important reason for implementing microservices, the autonomy. But of course, as everything other in IT, there is a trade-off, okay? So autonomy is great due to the business requirements, but not due to the uh, basic, uh, basic math. Why? Because when we are talking about the two microservices, those two microservices are fully independent, okay? And the problem is that the uh, probability of the uh, independent events, so the joint probability of the independent events is equal to the product of their probabilities. Okay, and why it's important? Because if I have three components with the uh, SLA, let's say 99.A, the joint probability will be just 99.4, okay? And what's going even worse, if I have 10 components with three nines high of uh, HI, then the joint probability and the joint uptime, joint SLA, is just two nines, okay? It's 10 times worse, okay? So when you think about the availability versus downtime, so I can see that uh, the two nines is the downtime uh, four days per year and 14 minutes per day. Okay, for the three nines, it's uh, more than one minute per day, which means that if you are going to do continuous deployment and you are going to deploy your software every day on production, then restarting the application, which has like 80,000 lines of code, takes around one minute, a minute and a half, 90 seconds. Okay, that's the real values. And it means that just Restarting my applications on production gives me three nines, and that's all. Ten services brings me two nines, and two nines, it's not the best SLA that we want to, you know, just provide to our customers. Okay, we want to get more. So, what's the real problem here? It's not just a number of the microservices that we're using in our company but it's more related to the depth of those microservices. And to be honest, to be honest not just the depth, uh, synchronous depth. What does it mean? Imagine you have an um, e-commerce platform. Uh, this e-commerce platform is the place where you want to place an order. I want to buy something, buy a new computer, okay? And Let's say that their architecture is created in the way where 10 different services must be up and running at the same time to finish my order, okay? One outage of the one single microservice causes that I cannot just run my, my order, okay? Because I need to synchronously communicate with 10 services to be sure that this system works, and that's the problem. So what we must do in the microservices, and that's our first, let's say, weapon of fighting with this um, uh, poor maintainability, is to prefer the asynchronous communication. Why? Because let's assume that the last microservice is payment, okay? And the payment gateway is now uh, not, not, not operating. I've already finished my order. Now I'm waiting for the email from the platform with the link that allows me to finish the, 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 the payment process, okay? So introducing asynchronous communications allow us to reduce the synchronous depth of, of, my, of my services. And going next, uh, we need to talk about the quality, okay? It's often hard to maintain the high quality even of the single system and going with the distributed systems when there are much more things that can fail. The network can fail, the latency can fail, uh, the, the, the virtual machines can fail, single applications can fail. Okay, there are uh, much 
more things that can go, go bad, okay? So how can we maintain the quality? How can we verify if those applications are working correctly in such distributed system as microservices? And the first thing that we must remember is that we, we must follow and, and prefer the loose coupling over canonical model, okay? I was a huge fan of the canonical model, but it just doesn't work in the distributed systems. Even sharing details doesn't work at all. Why? Imagine the situation, and it's the situation we, 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 we run into uh, at DevScaler. Um, we had a DTO, okay, data transfer object with uh, the project type. The project type which was describing that uh, this project contains the Maven file, a Gradle file, the no Xcode build or something like that, okay? And you are sending this project information to the service that maintains the uh, code repositories at our, at our system, okay? It's the, the code repositories that, are, that uh, can be shared with the candidates, with the task authors, etc. And imagine the situation that we are adding new project type. Okay, and I'm sending this project type to the repository service. And repository service is not reading this project type. It doesn't care about which project uh, will, be, uh, will, will be kept in this, uh, in, this, um, uh, in, in this repository. But what happens when you have a shared DTO and you are trying to unmarshal the value of the enum that you don't know? Exception, yeah, exactly, it's 500. So I'm failing because I'm reading the field that I don't care about at all, okay? So that's why we don't want to use the canonical model because canonical model is the same as the binary communication, especially in Java, which is strongly typed. You change the ty type of the date. It's not date, it's timestamp. Sorry, I cannot unmarshal it. I was looking for a different field, 500, go back. Retry when you will fix it, okay? And it doesn't matter if I need this data or not, it's in the model. It's in the model that I'm trying to unmarshal. So it doesn't work at all. No shared details, only loose, uh, loose coupled model in distributed systems. So, okay, I won't have the canonical model, I will just leave it. So how can I verify the quality of the communication? And the simplest answer is just to use the end-to-end -end tests. But end-to-end -end tests are not working in a distributed environment when you have a lot of components. Why? Because the stage is living. All the time someone is deploying something, someone is fixing something, someone is breaking something, okay? So it's really hard. And I was working in a company which were using and implementing distributed systems, not the microservices. There were like 40 components, just 40. And such integration environment was green like once per month one day per month, and then we said, oh, green, let's release it. Everything goes to the production because it's green. The next situation will be in the 30 days, okay? So we don't want to go that way. So should I avoid end-to-end -end tests? Yes, just use end-to-end -end tests when they're really necessary and the critical paths in your application. But no canonical model, no shared details, no end-to-end -end tests, so how to ensure the quality? So the answer is verify just the communication, verify contracts, okay? So what is the contract? Let's assume that I want to be sure if A is able to communicate with B. So I introduce the contract. What is the contract of the A server? Contract for the A server is, for example, if you will send me a GET request with such and such header and uh, uh, such and such query parameters, then I will respond with the status 200, such and such header, uh, this content type, and such and such body. Okay, that's my contract. And if I know that A is able to talk with this contract, and B is able to talk with this contract, 
then I know that A is probably able to talk with B. Okay? And uh, there were no good tool about uh, that because uh, the, the pattern is known. It was described like 10 years ago by Martin Fowler. It's called the consumer driven contract. And uh, there were no good tool. So um, uh, me and Marcin Grzeszczak, we have started the project called Accurest. Now it's, uh, it's adopted by the Pivotal and it's called the Spring Cloud Contract. And it's the project that allows you to write this contract in simple groovy DSL files. And then do two things. First thing is that we generate the tests, automatically generate the tests for the server side, which verifies if hitting such request for the server generates the valid proper output. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we generate a stop of this server. And when you are verifying your client, then you are not hitting the server with the end-to-end -end test. You are just hitting the stop of the server, which emulates the server, which behaves in the same way that real server. Why do I know that? Because I verified it with the automated server tests. And using this one, I can say that, OK, my communication works due to this really simple, simple uh, math. So the contracts and consumer-driven contracts is great and working replacement for end-to-end -end tests. What's next? Next is that even if you verify everything, you test with your unit tests everything that's possible, you will still fail, OK? Because failure is an option. And what is important here? When, you are, when we are talking about the design for failure, there are two branches that we can follow. First branch is fail safe. Okay? So I must prepare everything to not fail. And it just simply not, doesn't work. So let's ignore it. The second one is safe to fail. Okay? I know that I will fail, so I will prepare to do everything so the consequences of my fail will be good enough for me. I won't break my application. I won't break my system. I won't break my customers. I will fail, but this fail will be as cheap as possible. And I promise you that you will, there is 100% chance you will fail. Okay? Because there are so many things that can fail, even totally not uh, caused by you. Do you remember the S3 outage? from the Amazon? Was there anything I, I could do to prevent it? No. Of course I can split my application uh, and, and, and use AWS, uh, Azure, uh, Google Cloud, just to be sure that it works. But what, what are the costs here? Okay? Does it make sense? No. It's just a failure. Okay? I know that that will be failure. Sorry. No problem. So what can we do to prepare our system for the failures. So uh, the first thing, if you have a kid and you ask the question and the kid just ignores you, you just repeat, 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 and after five times, you see, you hear, no. But that's the sucks. I've got a response, OK? And the same applies to the microservices. You talk to the microservice, but this microservice is not responding. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's redeploying. Maybe there is no network communication. Maybe there is some other problem. So let's retry my communication. Maybe to another instance of this application. Maybe just let's try this, the same instance two more times, three more times, and uh, we'll get the, the response. What happens if I'm not able to talk this to this application because there is simply no this application? I don't know why, but it's not responding at all. So there is no, it's not a problem for me because I was prepared to such situation because thanks to design for failure. Okay? And what I can do right now is to simply apply the emergency procedure. Okay? 
let's assume that there is an anti-fraud system that verifies if the system can, uh, the, the, the user can complete the order or uh, should it be rejected and treated as a fraud, okay? The happy path looks like client, is, uh, client or the customer is placing the order. I'm asking the fraud system if this is fraud or not fraud. Fraud system is telling me no, it's not fraud, everything is okay, I'm finishing the order, okay? And now the set path. I'm asking client is placing the order, I'm asking the fraud system, and there is no fraud system. It's down. I don't know why. What can I do? I don't know. But maybe business knows. So I'm going to the business and I'm saying, okay, so dear business, what can I do if the fraud system is down? Uh, it should be up all the time. I said, yeah, I know we are trying to do our best, but it, it's down right now. What can I do? You're fired. Okay, but what next? <laughs> hmm. Okay, so maybe if it's a new customer, then let's assume it's fraud. If it's an existing customer, then let's say it's not fraud. Okay. Good enough for me. That will be my fallback. That will be my emergency procedure. Okay? The fraud system is not responding. Is it a new customer? Yes. Yeah. So it's fraud. Is it existing customer? Yeah. So continue. Go on. Okay? I'm prepared for such situation. Okay? And it's decision of my business, not developers, how this fallback should be uh, implemented. Okay? The next thing, as we are avoiding the end-to-end -end tests, how can I be sure that my application is working correctly? All processes are working correctly. It can't be. If I'm not verifying something, it can go bad. But it's okay, still. Do you think that we are, it's usual for us that systems has errors? Oh, it's not working, I will try later. Is it a big deal, big problem for the customers? If it's not too late, then I can try later. It's normal. I'm trying to buy a ticket for the train. It's not working, I will try in five minutes. I'm trying to place an order to buy a TV. It's not working, okay, I will try tomorrow. It's not a huge deal usually. Of course, there are critical paths in our applications. And those critical paths should be verified with the end-to-end -end tests. But the rest of the features, because features are not equal, there are more important features and less important features, okay? So I can just ignore those less important features and fix them as ASAP as possible, okay? What do I need to fix the bug really, really fast? like in two hours, an hour, 30 minutes. I need a good luck sometimes, but what is more important, uh, I need a continuous deployment. Why? Because if I'm releasing today 3,000 commits, there is a pretty big chance that some, something will break. And it's pretty big chance that it will be hard to find what's wrong because in the service, we just break down, there are like 300 commits made um, uh, by developers in the last six months. But when you are going to continuous deployment, you have like 20 commits from the last day. And yesterday, this feature was working. So is it hard to find the error? No, because usually it's it happened in some service, and you see that there is just one commit in this service, sometimes two, okay? So diagnosing this, this, this issue is really simple, due to the small changes released to production every single day, okay? So if you have a continuous deployment, if you have fast enough deployment pipeline, then you can just avoid end-to-end -end tests. Okay, so we are using uh, a Destler continuous deployment and our pipeline, which deploys the microservice to production, takes no more than 15 minutes to the full production rollout. So if I fix a bug and I merge it to the master, in 15 minutes, 
is released to all production environment, to all production instances, okay? And that's something that I use instead of the uh, extensive testing. I'm just fixing this issue as fast, as soon as possible, okay? Let's move to the next topic, the performance, okay? We L like to talk about the performance. And what's interesting here is that everyone says that microservices are awesome. On every conference, you hear that microservices are just saving the world, okay? So you're getting back to the office just after the conference, you're going to the business and you're saying, hey, dear business, please give us the money and we'll rewrite our system to the microservices architecture and it will be awesome, faster, safer, etc." But wait, why the microservices are going to be faster than the monolith? There is no network communication, the monolith. There is no serialization, the serialization, okay? It's just faster. Yes, the monoliths are much more faster than microservices. There are no transactional issues in monolith because everything happens in a single transaction. In microservices, there are no transactions. You must take care about the transa tr transactional issues by yourself. Go on, okay? So there is a problem that after cutting the monolith, it will be slower. Okay, the uptime will degradate. So what can we do to ensure that it's not slower? What can we do to fix the performance? Yeah, let's run the performance tests, okay? No, performance tests are on the same branch as the end-to-end -end test. It simply doesn't work, why? Because performance tests are really, really expensive. They are also really, really inaccurate and really, really tricky. There is a great talk by Jill Tanner uh, called How Not to Measure the, the Latency. Uh, you should watch it and see how Java and how performance tests are lying to you all the time. Because the application is warming up, okay? Because we have warmed up the application and we are verifying just the single branch. And what do we need to do and to run the good performance tests? We need a production traffic. And a production traffic usually happens on production. Yeah? That's simple. So how can I run production uh, performance tests using production traffic? To be honest, there is no way to do that. But I can monitor the production using tools like the APM, like the New Relic. Okay, uh, and any, any other tools like Dynatrace, okay, to verify the current performance on production system. And those tools often can uh, show me that, okay, so you are, you, you are having some performance issues and uh, those issues are in, in this method or in this line. Okay, good enough, in this query. This SQL query is not, not, not uh, optimal, fix it. Okay, so I'm using the metrics, I'm using the monitoring all the time. But even if I know that I must run the monitoring and I must continue, continuously monitor my application in production, it's not so easy as everything on this talk. Why? Because there is something called the Anscomp Quartet. Have you seen something like this? So what's that? As you can see, there are four totally different data sets that have nearly identical uh, statistics, uh, uh, descriptive statistics, okay? It has the same mean, the same standard deviation, the same variance, the same correlation, the same linear regression, etc. etc. And as you can see, uh, these uh, data sets are pretty different. So if this data set describes, for example, the response time uh, for the, I don't know, number of users that are concurrently running an application, there is pretty big difference between this one and this one. Okay? So the statistics is lying to us all the time as well as the performance tests, which are using the statistics. So what can we do to make it better? There are percentiles. What is the percentile or the centile? 
It's a measure used in statistics, okay, that indicates the value below which uh, a given percentage of observation uh, falls into the uh, desired group, okay? So the 90 percentile tells us that the 90 percent of all observations are grouped in a single, uh, into, a single, uh, into a single group, okay? And why it's important for us? Because uh, when we are talking about the response time of our application, I'm not talking about the all responses. I'm talking about some particular group of those responses. Like, I will ensure you, my dear customer, that 95% of your responses will finish in uh, less than one second. Not 100%, but 95, maybe 99. And that's my question for you. Which percentile is important for us? Who thinks that the 95% of requests, ensuring that 95% of requests will finish in time is good enough? Just raise your hand. Okay, 99. Okay, 99.5. Okay, so the, uh, the, the winner is uh, 95. Now let's take a look at uh, such, uh, such calculation. Let's assume that I have 10 requests per single page, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> ensuring that 90% of my requests gives me the 100% probability that this page will load longer than expected. Why? Because I'm doing uh, 10 requests. And I'm just guaranteeing that nine of those requests will finish in the desired time. And the rest, I don't know. Maybe it will finish, maybe not, okay? P95 gives me 50% that this page will load much longer than I expected, okay? 99 gives me 10%. So, to sum up this, Verifying the 99 percentile and assuming that there are 10 requests per page and there are 10 pages per session gives us 100% of the frustrated users. So in the real applications, uh, we must monitor the P99.9 .9 or even 99.95 to be sure that our application is performing well. And it's really hard, especially in Java, due to garbage collection, due to caching, due to jitting, due to compilation, the optimization, etc. Okay? It's not so easy. And even if you are monitoring the P99.9, you must continuously verify what's just around the corner. Do I have some performance margin that I can use um, uh, when, when there will be, a, I don't know, peak in the traffic? or I'm just living on the edge, okay? So that's uh, regarding the performance. And really important thing uh, for now is that the microservices are assuming that there are much more components that on a standard deployment, okay? I'm talking not about the 10 of servers, I'm talking about the hundreds of servers, okay? I'm talking about the hundreds of applications, okay? And how can I live and how, how can I deal with such giant scale? So the automation is a key for that. How can I automate the giant company? It's a huge cost. Yes and no, because if you want to automate stuff, you must remember about the convention over configuration, okay? Convention over configuration is a must when you are going to introduce the, the automation. Why? Because assume that you must configure the name of the service, artifact ID, repository URL, name of the server, jar name, etc. It's a lot of stuff. So wh what gives me the convention? I'm saying, okay, so if the server is called the pipeline, then it lives in the repository called pipeline. The jar is placed in the target slash pipeline.jar. The suffix of the server is pipeline. The user of application user is pipeline, okay? So I'm assuming all those stuff 
because that's my convention, okay? And as long as you have just the name of the service, you can do everything. So for example, in our uh, infrastructure, we are not configuring any relationships with the infrastructure, which seems strange. So you are creating a server, and you are not telling this server that it should use some load balancer. No, I'm not. Because I know why I'm creating this server. I'm creating this server for the application called Pipeline. So I know what's the name of the load balancer for the same application, OK? Because I have a convention. So what can I do when creating the server? Just verify if load balancer for the application pipeline exists. And if this load balancer exists, just use it. Because it's the reason that this load balancer exists in this component. It exists, I've created it to use it. So I don't need to configure that, yeah, please use this load balancer. No, I have a convention. OK, and I have these strong conventions everywhere. Should I use the uh, public IP address? I don't know. Is there a public IP address for this component? Yes, it is, so use it. That's the way, that's the reason why this, this, uh, this IP address was created, OK? So it's similar uh, if you are aware of Spring Boot. Spring Boot works in, the, in a similar way. Is there a my, my SQL driver on the class path? Yes, so use it, because it was provided here to be used. I don't need to configure it. It's a convention, OK? And if I have this convention, it's really easy to, uh, for example, automate pipelines. Can I, uh, uh, I don't know, change the JVM, JDK version uh, uh, by clicking 10 jobs on Jenkins? Of course I can. But are you sure you can change the prefix of the repository URL on 1,000 jobs? So happy clicking, OK? I don't want to click it. I want those jobs to be regenerated by some automation script, for example, by using the job DSL on Jenkins. OK? So that's the pipeline as a code. I know how to build my application, and it's really simple to change everything. Do you want to introduce the Slack notification? No problem. Just add it into one sim sim simple script, and it will be applied to all your thousands of jobs. OK? The same happens to the infrastructure. Do you want to back up your infrastructure? No, I don't want to back up my infrastructure. So what can I do to not back up at all any configuration or on servers? If I'm creating this configuration, if I'm producing this configuration from my scripts like Ansible, Chef, or Puppet, why should I back up it? I'm able to recreate it in minutes. So I don't need to back up anything except the data. Okay? And it's much easier to back up the database than to back up information about the all packages installed on the server, all configuration done in uh, ETC or something like this. Okay? So I'm simplifying my infrastructure to create and to uh, be able to maintain it easily. Okay? No backups really simplify the maintenance uh, of the of the application, okay? The same applies to the configuration, okay? If I must manage the configuration of my application, manage the, I don't know, VM parameters, the JVM garbage collection tuning or something like this one, it must be um, in a proper way, okay? So for example, keeping the configuration, all application properties in Git gives me many important things. If it's in Git, then it's versioned. I can blame on lines to check, hey, why someone changed the password to the, the database? Okay, it's due to such Jira ticket uh, from such project, okay, and it makes sense, okay? Why have you turned off this feature? I don't know, let's check in, uh, in, in Git, okay? So that's the way all this automation as a code allows me to produce the application that is really maintainable because I can verify, I can check, I can audit, 
and I can repeat all the time. Okay? If I have a problem that uh, uh, my server is lost, there was a server and uh, there is no server anymore. It takes me five minutes to recreate this server from scratch because my hardware infrastructure is automated. I'm just running one sim simple uh, application or job and it's creating my servers, hardware's uh, virtual machines uh, in the cloud. Okay? Then I run my Ansible script to install everything. Then I run my Ansible script to, to deploy the application. And after five minutes, this application is up and running on production. Okay? Thanks to the automation. And without automation, it's impossible to maintain such giant scale systems as the microservices, even if you have 20 microservices instead of 100. You must automate everything. And I hope that this book won't be released in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in nine years, so we won't get back from the microservices to monolith, but still, you must remember that microservices are not saving the world. If you need the autonomy, if you need the flex business flexibility, okay, if you are running uh, or, or working in Agile, Scrum, or any other uh, methodologies, then yes, microservices can help. If you are going to do one release per six months and you are not using the agile feedback loop, then there is really no way microservices will help you. Okay? So that's all I have for now. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I will try to answer them. Any questions? Yeah, there is a question in the middle. Uh, okay, so you said about the convention over configuration, but still you have to hold the knowledge about the convention somewhere. So. You have to yes. deal with mm -hmm. some That's kind of the documentation. Good question. So uh, the question is, uh, where should I keep the information about the conventions? So that's the reason, for example, we are not using Ansible to uh, provision our hardware infrastructure, because there is no way to uh, describe all those conventions in Ansible. So we are trying to create our own all Ansible modules to do that. But uh, we finished in our own application for pr provisioning the infrastructure. And this application is written in Java. And all those business rules about naming things, about relationships uh, with, with the things. Like, for example, when you are creating the load balancer, verify if there is an uh, uh, IP address for this load balancer. If you are creating the network interface, just verify if there is a load balancer or application gateway that you can use. So we have implemented in, in Java code, because everything must be as a code, and that's another another place uh, and another thing that that we are automating with with the Java code. Yeah. Other questions? No questions. Okay. So if you decide to ask me the question uh, in private, I'm here, and I will be as well on the uh, on the party in the evening. So thank you very much and enjoy the conference. <laughs> <laughs>